Acts. We are in Acts 14. That's where we will begin this morning. The events of Acts chapter 14 take place about AD 47 to 48, approximately. And we're going to see the opposition beginning to build against the Lord's church. It says in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. Notice this. They spoke in such a manner. It wasn't the Holy Spirit directly that did this. It was their Holy Spirit-inspired word that did this. They spoke in such a manner. You know, that's the kind of speaking that we need to do today in religion. Speak in such a manner that a large number of people, it says, believed. We've mentioned before that this is a synecdoche, a synecdoche if I can say the word, uh, where a part is placed in, uh, 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 for the whole. In this case, it says they believed, which indicates that they simply obeyed the gospel. Some of our religious friends say, you see, they believe, that means they weren't baptized. No, that's not what it means at all. Because you're going to go by that reasoning, then they did not repent because it doesn't mention that they repented. This obviously is a catch-all word, which indicates that they obeyed. They obeyed the truth. They did exactly what the people at Pentecost did in Acts 2, and they did exactly what the people in Samaria and the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, and what Cornelius and his household did in Acts 10. They believed and were baptized. They obeyed the gospel. So a large number of people believed both of Jews and of Greeks. So the gospel, of course, is now being is now spreading, spreading a, on a much wider basis. Notice also what they did. They entered the synagogue of the Jews and spoke. Now that's different from modern practices. Modern day practices tell us, modern day uh, uh, sensibilities tell us, don't step on anybody's toes. Don't go and offend anyone. That's what we're told. Now, we can't be deliberately offensive in the way that we do things. But the truth itself is going to offend. I thank God that my grandfather was offended in 1939 when he first heard the gospel preached. He just knew that that preacher was not right on baptism. He was determined to prove that preacher wrong. As it turned out, when he did his own studying, I'm wrong. I need to change. I thank God that he was offended. But it caused him to study and to learn the truth. We've got to speak in such a way that people obey the truth. And we need to go where they are to preach and to teach the truth. Notice verse 2. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. You're going to have opposition. Luke is very clear in this book that the truth almost from the start received opposition from those that didn't want to obey it. It should not shock us and it should not surprise us if we receive opposition when we teach and preach the truth. Now, if we teach and preach error, you can better believe there needs to be opposition. But when you teach and preach the truth, you're going to receive opposition. And that's what takes place here. They embittered them against the brethren. Verse 3, what, how, what was their reaction? Did they fold up in a fetal position and simply stop doing what they're going to do? Oh, woe was us because we're receiving opposition. No, therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who is testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Notice. They didn't stop preaching. In fact, they preached even more. They preached boldly. They were going to preach the truth regardless of the opposition. And that's what we need to have today in the church. Preach and teach the truth regardless of the opposition. 
We live in the most secular age that I have ever seen in my lifetime. I'm not that old. But in my short life, I have not seen the secularization that I'm seeing now. The opposition to basic fundamental Bible teaching and preaching that I'm seeing now. And it's by some, in some quarters, religious people. That is to say that they don't believe that Jesus really was resurrected from the tomb. That they don't really believe that he died on the cross. They don't really believe that he was born in Bethlehem. Basic truths. And I could go on and on and on. And if you preach and teach simply what the Bible says, are people going to accept it with open arms? Widely and broadly, no. You're going to be opposed. And in some cases, very much so. But that means that we need to keep on preaching and teaching even more boldly. Notice, who was te- the Lord was testifying to the word of his grace. How do we accept grace? We hear the word of his grace and we obey the word of his grace. It's interesting how Luke describes the gospel, the terms that he uses to describe the gospel of Christ. You're going to see that throughout this passage. Several different phrases that is used to describe the same thing. The word of his grace. Notice, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Their hands. That's how the signs and wonders were performed. But the people of the city were divided. And some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe in the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So now they go to the interior region of Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, to give you an idea where this is. And they continue to preach. This is a short missionary tour, but it's very effective. Notice, at Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet. There's Luke's attention to detail, being a physician. He pinpoints exactly where the problem was. Laying from his mother's womb, who had never walked. Notice, Luke, being a physician, specifies where the problem is. He has no strength in his feet. He's laying from his mother's womb, and he had never walked. He's given you the diagnosis, his own diagnosis as a physician through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. And Luke says he just staggered up to his feet and began, no. He just began to stumble. No, it says he leaped up and began to walk. There was no question as to the healing of this man. There was no question as to his infirmity. Everyone knew apparently that he had been laying from his mother's womb. He had never been able to walk and all of a sudden, not only can he walk, he jumps up. Just like the man whom Peter and John had healed at the beautiful gate in Jerusalem that we saw. He leaps up. And he began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying the Lyconian language, Luke's attention to detail here, Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. Now that is an honest mistake on their part. They were simply going on by what they had been taught all of their lives in paganism. They said, this is obviously something that's divine, and so the gods themselves have come down. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus. That's interesting. And Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Hermes, the Greek god Hermes, is the Roman god Mercury, or vice versa. Uh, Still, Uh, Zeus was the leader of the gods. So they acknowledged that Barnabas at this late stage was still the leader, but yet Paul was akin in their mind to Hermes, the messenger. That's what Hermes was known as. The priest of Zeus, 
whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Now get this picture. The whole crowd is going crazy because of what Paul and Barnabas have done. They're beginning to laud them and, and of course it's almost out of their control as far as what they're doing. But now the priest of Zeus is bringing out animals. He's about to sacrifice animals to Paul and Barnabas. And so what is their reaction? But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of the same nature of you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. He says, Stop this. We're just men like you are. Notice that Luke describes Barnabas and Paul as apostles. Does that mean that Barnabas was an apostle like the twelve or like Paul? No. There's two ways in which the word apostle is used in the New Testament. The word apostle itself means one who is sent. And in this sense, it's used in its generic term. Luke is not saying that Barnabas is an apostle as described in Acts chapter 1 when the qualifications of an apostle are given and Matthias is chosen to be with the twelve. Or that Paul was an apostle born out of due time in the sense he was chosen to be the apostle of the Gentiles. In this sense, Barnabas and Paul are apostles in the sense they have been sent for this mission. And so what happens? They tear their clothes. They tear their robes. This is a traditional Jewish way of, of uh, expressing uh, 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 very much an upset nature and trying to get attention to the people to stop what they're doing. And so he quotes from two passages, Psalms 33, 6 and Psalms 81, 12. He's trying to make the point to them that there is one God, verse 16. In the generation gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, even saying these things with difficulty. They restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. Even with all of this, they couldn't hardly keep them from offering up those animals to themselves. That's an un, that is a, a very chaotic situation that Luke describes, that Paul and Barnabas barely get their hands upon, they barely control, but they finally quell it. Verse 19, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now think about that one for a moment. The Jews match up with the pagans. Politics makes strange bedfellows, we're often told. Well, religion makes strange bedfellows too sometimes. So here's the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and they went over these pagan crowds, and they persuade them to stone Paul, kill him. Go ahead and kill him. He's trying to be, uh, make himself to be one of your gods. You take him outside the city and stone him and kill him. Now Paul refers to this incident in 2 Corinthians 11.25 when he lists all of the things that happened to him when he's preaching the gospel. He said, once I was stoned, that's this incident right here. He was stoned. And they're not talking about small rocks. We're talking about big, big rocks. Big boulders. And they left him for dead. They supposed him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. He's alive. Now, Likely, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when the Apostle Paul says that I knew a man in Christ some years ago, and this man was caught up to the third heaven and saw unspeakable things which are not lawful for a man to utter, he's talking about himself. He was allowed to look into paradise. I believe this is when that took place. I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but I believe this is that incident 
where he was allowed to go to paradise and see unspeakable things or hear unspeakable things was not allowed, not lawful for a man to utter. So, interesting. This is an interesting incident. He's allowed to come back. And he continues, verse 21, after they had preached the gospel. Notice, please, so far, the word of his grace, the gospel, and again, the gospel. They preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. So you've got the word of his grace, the gospel, the faith, referring to the same thing. And saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now you think about this for a moment. Here's Paul and Barnabas. Paul has just been stoned and left for dead. And he comes to those brethren, and with the marks, the wounds of those stonings, or that stoning, still present on his body. He says, through much tribulation, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Do you think that would make a powerful impact upon brethren? You better believe it would. When he says, let there, from henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The marks of the Lord Jesus. He's talking about physical marks on his body. And of course, the marks of faithfulness is what he's really stressing. But Paul had those marks, those physical marks of persecution all over his body by the time he leaves this life. And in this occasion, he still has those fresh wounds of that stoning. And he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is the first, the earliest mention in the New Testament of appointments of elders. This is where we first see appointment of elders in the church. And they appointed elders in every church. Of course, these elders had to meet certain qualifications before they could be appointed elders. Uh, it's not the case that a church must have elders even if men don't meet the qualifications. That's not how it works. You've got to meet the qualifications to become elders. But still, they appointed elders in every church. That is the ideal for every church to have elders to oversee the congregation. And they prayed with fasting. Prayed with fasting. Here is another instance of ordination, if you want to call it that way, of elders. They prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. They passed through Bithynia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atala. They come back down to where they had left initially. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God. Notice, it's the word of his grace, it's the gospel, it's the faith, and now it's the grace of God. All referring to the same thing. All these terms refer to the same thing that they're preaching. They committed to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Notice, a door of faith. There are great and effectual doors that are open to us today. And the door of faith can be opened. And in this case, it was because preachers had been sent. Preachers had been sent, the door of faith was opened, and the word of his grace, the gospel, the faith, was taking hold. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Exactly how long we are told, not specifically. Uh, but the events of chapter 14 are about 80, 48 to 49. The events of chapter 15 that we're about to see is around 80, 49. So it's probably some weeks or even months that transpire between the end of chapter 14 
and the beginning of chapter 15. Any questions or comments before we move on into the events of chapter 15? All right. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is the first false teaching that arises within the Lord's church, right here. This is also what I call proto-antiism. Why? Because they're making a law for God. Do you think the Lord was anticipating the things that we would go through today in the church? You better believe he was. The very first problem, the very first false teaching that arises in the church are brethren binding where God is not bound. Restricting where God is not restricted. Making laws for God, as Brother Gus Nichols used to say. Well, they're making laws for God. Unless you're circumcised according to the manner of Moses, the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. And notice, when Paul and Barnabas said, no, we don't want to have any problems. We don't want there to be any, just, just, we, we, we get along. No, that's not what they did. When Paul, Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Paul and Barnabas wasn't going to let this slide. They weren't going to let this go. They were going to tackle this head on, straight forward head on, and try to get this thing quelched. And so this problem is so widespread at this early stage that they've got to call a meeting in Jerusalem. The apostles and elders, they're to go up to Jerusalem concerning this. Now, I used to believe that what Paul describes in Galatians 2 corresponds with Acts 15. But I've mentioned to you before, I don't believe that now. I believe that the events of, of Galatians 2 correspond back earlier in Acts chapter 11 because it matches uh, more correctly plus uh, the hypocrisy of Peter and of Barnabas uh, is better explained if it's in Acts 11 rather than here in Acts 15. And I won't go into all the details of that, but still, what we see here is a meeting that has to take place. It has to take place to get this problem resolved. Verse 3, therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. So Barnabas and Paul tell about the conversion of the Gentiles and these brethren whom they talk to, they don't have prejudice in their hearts. And they rejoice. They're thankful to God. All of these individuals have obeyed the truth and they don't have any problem with it. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all that God had done with them. But... Some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. This attitude right here is at the heart of antiism. This attitude. It's necessary to do X. It's necessary to do Y. It's necessary to do Z in order to be saved when the Bible doesn't say it's necessary to do X. It's necessary to do Y. And it's necessary to do Z. Making laws for God. That's at the heart of the matter. Verse 6. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate gone back and forth. Some of the sect of the Pharisees that were pushing this thing, the apostles and elders were uh, debating with them back and forth. Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel. And believe. So here's another term that Luke uses. He said the word of his grace. He said the gospel. He said the faith. He said the grace of God. And now he says it's the word of 
the gospel. The same thing is being described in all these circumstances. They should by my mouth hear the word of the gospel and believe he is telling them by implication that which condemns Paul and Barnabas condemns me if we're going to be condemned for it. If you're going to condemn them, you've got to condemn me because, hey, I was the first one to preach to them. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. Here, Peter once again specifies the reason why Holy Spirit was poured out upon Cornelius and his household. This is the reason. He gave them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us and he made no distinction between us and them. No distinction. Cleansing their hearts by faith. Faith. Cleansing their hearts by faith. Notice he didn't say cleansing their hearts by faith alone. Many of our religious friends would say all you got to do is believe. Just believe. Just believe. Well, you got a problem with that because of what the New Testament teaches clearly in James chapter 2 and in many other passages and even in this book. We've already seen belief in baptism, repentance in baptism. By faith. What kind of faith is Peter talking about? Obedient faith. A faith that obeys the word of the gospel. Now, verse 10. Therefore, why do you put, to, put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? There's the crux of the matter right there. Some brethren today still try to do this. They still try to place a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which no one can bear. Unless you do X, unless you do Y, unless you do Z, which the New Testament does not specify as being necessary, they say unless you do this, you can't be a faithful child of God. It's interesting to me that some of our brethren that make laws for God look upon us who are trying to be faithful as worse than those of the denominations. How do I know that? I know that because many years ago my father converted a preacher out of the extreme right wing out of that kind of thinking and in conversations with him, he was told that. He said, we looked at you, that is, you brethren, then the institutional, as they would call it, camp. That's a bad name to use. He said, we looked at you as worse than those in the denominational world. That was an eye-opener. That was an eye-opener. And I've seen that attitude displayed myself. Unreal. Simply because we don't go with what they prefer, which you cannot for the life of you prove from the New Testament if your life depended on it. This kind of attitude is dealt with right here, head on, by the apostles and elders. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. How are we saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus? By obedience to the word of the gospel, the faith, the truth, what Luke's been talking about all this time. That's how we're saved, through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Now, if this is corresponding with Galatians chapter 2, how do you explain what Peter has just said in light of what Paul says in the latter part of Galatians 2 where he withstood him to the face because he was to be lame? His hypocrisy is unexplainable in Galatians 2 if this corresponds with it. But if Galatians 2 corresponds with Acts 11, the latter part of the chapter, then that hypocrisy is explainable because now Peter knows better fully. And he's able to say this without any kind of contradiction. Verse 12, all the people kept silent. And they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. They explained what has taken place. After they had stopped speaking, 
James answered. Now, who is this James? This is not James the apostle that was chosen by the Lord. He's already been killed by Herod. This James is the half-brother of Jesus. James and Jude, half-brothers of the Lord, obeyed the truth. They both wrote epistles that bear their names. This is that James. James is a leader at this point, a prominent leader among the brethren there in Jerusalem. And he was one of the elders of the church as well. Saying, brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Notice, he says about Peter, he uses the word Simeon. You say, I thought it was Simon. Yeah, it's Simon Peter, but that name Simon was a shortened form of his actual name, which was Simeon or Simeon. There's only one other place that this form of Peter's first name is used, and that's in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, where he says Simeon or Simeon Peter. James knew Peter well enough that he could use his actual first name, Simeon, Simeon. This also gives credence to Peter writing 2 Peter, which a lot of religious people don't believe that Peter wrote that book. I think there's good, good evidence that he did. And this is one of those pieces of evidence. Anyway, he says, Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. He's quoting here from Amos 9, 11 and 12. He says the prophets all bear witness to this. Now think about this, brethren. There were already people early on that saw this truth. Remember when the baby Jesus is presented to Simon in the temple. What does he say? That the Gentiles, he specifies that Gentiles may see your glory. He knows. There were certain individuals that saw the truth of this, but not it wasn't widespread. Here, James is simply confirming this. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. All these things, by the way, have been sinful in all ages of human history. When Noah and his family departed from the ark, what were they forbidden to do? Consume blood. What did Moses say specifically to the Israelites as part of the law of Moses? Do not consume blood. And what do we have here? Do not consume blood. Is this still binding upon us? You better believe it. You better believe it is. This is a universal truth throughout all ages. So that's his judgment. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. In other words, Moses is going to be preached in the synagogues, whatever we do here. But we've got to specify to these brethren, these Gentile brethren, and not allow their hearts to be troubled. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Here we have the first mention of Silas who will become prominent later. And, this, and they sent this letter by them. Now this letter that's recorded here from verses 23 through 29, this is the first inspired letter that was penned. The first letter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it's incorporated here in Luke's account. This is an inspired epistle to the Gentile brethren. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles. Greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls. I like how the King James puts it. To whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, we didn't give this instruction to them. They're unsettling your souls. It wasn't from us. 
It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas. They're unconnected with the Gentile conversion. Who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. That is, they will be witnesses to all of this. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. Again, I like how the King James puts it. No greater burden than these necessary things. This is the antidote to antiism in all ages. No greater burden than these necessary things. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. In other words, don't worry about these men. Don't worry about what they're saying. Didn't come from us. It's not from the Holy Spirit. This, that we're writing to you, this is from the Holy Spirit. We're laying upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, and they spell it out. You'll do well if you observe these things. Interesting. The antidote to antiism is to stick with the truth and don't go beyond it and don't restrict from it. Any questions or comments before we move forward in this chapter? Sir? Absolutely, this epistle went a long way toward diffusing the situation in Jerusalem and the surrounding region, or actually in, in the areas in which, to which they're writing, Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, uh, diffusing the situation. Now, this is not the end of the controversy, obviously, but it goes a long way toward quelling it, because the church is going to continue to have this problem for a time, uh, but... This is a strong statement, no question, what you just said. This is a very strong statement by the leadership of the brethren that it didn't come from us, you didn't hear it from us, and this is what the Holy Spirit through our word, through our uh, pen, has directed us to tell you. And that's always a good thing. When brethren can speak with one voice, unified, and they can speak definitively about things. Any other comments, questions before we move forward? Yes. Right. Yes. The Old Testament, a lot of people go to the Old Testament and pick and choose what they want, just like they do often with the New Testament. But they'll try to justify the religious practices by going to the Old Testament. Say, well, David said, praise him with the psaltery, praise him with the heart, praise him with symbols, so we can do that today. Well, also, the Bible tells us that, you know, you can, in the Old Testament, that you need to kill your enemies. Are we going to start killing our enemies? Are we going to start killing those that violate the Sabbath? That's what the Old Testament says. That's what the Psalms talk about. Well, that which proves too much proves nothing, obviously. The New Testament is what we go by in matters of faith and practice. And we can't restrict where God is not restricted. We cannot loose where God is not loose. Quickly, verse 30. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of his encouragement. Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves. Judas and Silas are prophets, New Testament prophets. Encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. That was the chief work of New Testament prophets, by the way, is to encourage and strengthen brethren. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. So Silas stays. 
But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. Here's another phrase that Luke uses to describe the same message. The word of his grace, the gospel, the faith, and now it's the word of the Lord. The same thing is being described in all of these different terms. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. He's proposing a second missionary journey, which will happen. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. Remember John Mark? Barnabas is kin to him. He wants John Mark to go. But... Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had got not gone with them to the work. Remember that took place back in chapter 13? Remember I told you we'd be seeing this again? Here it is. Paul's been thinking about this all this time. It's been in the back of his mind that John Mark left us when he thinks we needed him and he's holding that against him. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now look at this. They go their separate ways. The disagreement is sharp between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas is a son of consolation. He's an encourager. He's the one that vouched for Paul early on when the brethren didn't want to accept him. And here they have a disagreement, and it's a sharp disagreement. They had words. They had heated words, in other words. This is the last time we see Barnabas in the book of Acts. We'll see him in other places in Paul's epistles. But Paul's anger would subside. 1 Corinthians 9, 6, he mentions Barnabas by name. So by the time he writes the book of 1 Corinthians, which is about maybe two to three years after this, his anger's already subsided about this. Later on in Colossians 4, 11, he would commend Mark. He would also commend Mark in Philemon 24. And in 2 Timothy 4, 11, he would say about John Mark, he is profitable to me for the ministry. I believe in this sharp disagreement that Paul was, was wrong. I don't think he was sinful. I don't think he sinned. I just think he was not correct. For whatever reason, he held this against Barnabas at this moment. But notice, this should encourage us. If these two great men, if these two great gospel preachers could have a sharp disagreement to the point that they separated and they didn't allow that to break fellowship, then brethren, we can get along. We can get along today ourselves, even if we have sharp disagreements. It doesn't mean that we end fellowship. Paul didn't write up Barnabas to the brethren and say, you don't need to accept that good for nothing Barnabas because here's what he did. Barnabas didn't do the same against Paul. Here's what that good for nothing Paul did. You don't need to accept him. They didn't do that. They eventually worked it out. There's hope for us today. And we'll continue with our study next week.